Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. We are starting a brand new series today called A Journey Through Genesis, and like you've been hearing all morning, we're connecting children's, teens, and adults all together to be on the same page at the same time. We want to give you resources to be the spiritual head of your households and to develop your families in the Word of God. The ride home uh, is actually a pretty cool thing. It'll be an MP3 that you can stream from your phone to your car. And it just has some questions that you can talk about in the car on the ride home with your family. And then there's a weekly devotional that you can get from our website or text it to you. So stay connected with what's happening. And I told the team this, we're trying it out. We have a lot of hours invested in creating this. So it's either going to be a great success or an epic failure. Either way, we're trying it out, okay? So if you don't engage with it, we probably are not going to do this again. You get what I'm saying? Because it's a lot of work if, if it's not what you want. But we've heard people say, I want to be the spiritual head of my household, but I don't have resources to do it. Well, here it is. You'll have no more excuses. If you don't do it, then it's on you. You get what I'm saying? All right. So does anybody know what the first book of the Bible is called? Genesis. Genesis. Does anybody know what the word Genesis means? The beginning. Right? So like literally... Genesis 1-1, when it says, in the beginning, it's saying Genesis, right? So the word Genesis means the beginning or origin, how things came about, the beginning of all things. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I am slated with uh, this week to study Genesis 1 with you. We're going to dive into it, we're going to dissect it, and I hope that you have a great time with what we're going to look at, but let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you as we get into your word today that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, in Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody know what Sir Isaac Newton is most well known for? Discovery of gravity, the discovery of gravity, right? He was a 17th century English physicist, mathematician famous for discovering the law of gravity. And he said this, in the absence of any other proof, if I just looked at my own thumb, it would give me evidence enough that God exists. With all the intricate parts of a thumb, how did the thumb come about? It was it by accident. But check this out. On one occasion, to assist him in his studies, Isaac Newton constructed a model of a solar system. Anybody do that in science class with like the foam balls? So he did this, and sometime later, a friend of his, a fellow scientist who is also an atheist, walked into his office and asked him, oh my gosh, this is amazing, who created this model? And Sir Isaac Newton, really quick on his feet, knowing his friend's an atheist, says, nobody, it just appeared. And his friend got all mad and objected and charged him with being ridiculous, and Isaac Newton said to him, if you accept that this model needs a maker... Why do you have a problem when confronted with the actual universe needing a maker? As we begin this series of Genesis and the book of the beginnings, we need to understand a few things. Number one, the book of Genesis is not a science book. The book of Genesis is not a science book, okay? It is not scientifically written. The book of Genesis is not necessarily a history book. It has elements that can answer questions of science. It has a lot of historical information about the past, but neither one of those genres are the point to the book of Genesis. If the book of Genesis tried to be completely historical, it would fall short. It is believed and accepted. Who do we believe wrote the book of Genesis? Moses, right? It is believed and accepted that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Now understand this. Moses was not alive in the beginning. He wasn't there when Adam and Eve were created. It was hundreds of years later that he came about, right? So Moses is writing the book of Genesis, one, with oral history or oral tradition, stories passed down. 
and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, okay? So it doesn't give us every exact detail about science and history. The point of Genesis is to bring us to faith in God. Faith in God. And I know that we can have this stumbling block of trying to figure out how science and the Bible engage. How does science and the Bible interact? Is the earth 6,000 years old? Is it billions of years old? I'm going to tell you, none of that's the point. We're missing the whole point when we're trying to figure that out. The biggest stumbling block of Genesis is found in the very first verse. Ready? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If we cannot believe that statement, the rest of the Bible is mute, mute point. Don't even bother reading it. If you, if you cannot believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, God, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, then you don't have faith for the rest of the Bible. Yeah, but I want to believe in that heaven part. Well, how can you believe in the heaven part if you don't believe God created it? Come on, somebody. That's the, big, that's the biggest point of the Bible, of, of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you cannot believe that, it's going to be very difficult to come to God any other way. So let's take a look at this. In the beginning, God, that's the Hebrew word Elohim. Elohim. You got to say the Elohim. <laughs> this word here means the plurality of God. So it's a plural word. It's not a singular word. It's not a singular word God, but almost to the extent of the gods created the heavens and earth. And what it is in reference to is it took the Godhead. It took all of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It took all three of them to bring about creation. And so it could be said like this, in the beginning, the Trinity, in the beginning, the Godhead created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's the second stumbling block, okay? The first one is, do you believe that a creator God created the heavens and the earth? And then the second stumbling block is, do you believe that the Trinity exists and that the Trinity has always existed? And so that's kind of a problem because our linear minds cannot understand eternity. We, we, we can try to understand that from here forward, my spirit will live forever. I'll never die. What we cannot understand is God never having a beginning. Well, when was that? Always. Yeah, but at what point was he? Always. God has always existed. We, our minds literally cannot grasp that. So when we're talking about the beginning, we're talking about the beginning of the creation story. God's presence coming into the universe to create us. So in the beginning, where time began, the Trinity or the Godhead created the heavens and the earth. So let's move into this. How can we believe that which we don't understand. How can we believe that which we don't understand? How can we believe that which we don't understand? And I'll kind of paint a picture like this. This morning I got in my car and I pushed the button. Well, I pushed the brake, pushed the button, and I believed that my car was going to start. How many else? How many, anybody else? Turn the key, push the button. You believed your car was going to start? Now, how about you explain to me everything that goes into starting that car? Because I don't understand every single thing. I know I push the button, and that wire goes down to like a fuse, and that fuse goes to a computer, and that computer like goes all different places, hits the starter, hits the fuel, fuel injection, starter going, spark plug. I don't know how it all works. I don't really care. As long as I push the button and it starts, we're good. But we want to freaking get all crazy when we're talking about creation. No, but I want to know all the details. You can't handle all the details. Gosh, we could not handle everything if God 
listen, the Bible says this at the end of the book of John. It says, if we wrote down everything that Jesus did in three years of ministry, I suppose the world could not contain the amount of books written. The, right? It's in the end of the book of John. The world could not contain the amount of books written if we wrote down everything Jesus did in three years. Could you imagine if God wrote down every step in creation? That's not the point. We don't have to understand in order to believe. That's why we have faith. That's why we have faith. Here's what I want you to know. I do not have to know exactly how God created the heavens and the earth. I don't care if it was seven or six literal 24-hour days or seven billion years. I don't care. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. When we get hung up on that, when we get hung up on the how, we lose sight of the who. It doesn't matter how the heavens and earth were created. It matters who created them. And I trust that he did a pretty good job. I trust he did a pretty good job. Here's what we have to believe. We're going to go into a few theories, but here's what we have to believe. Right here, Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We must believe that. We must have faith for that. By faith we understand that the universe was made by the what? Word of God. Now check this out. That parallels back to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the? Right? So the world was framed by the Word of God. There it is. So in the beginning was the Word. This is how it was framed. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Who? The Word. All things were made through the Word. The Word spoken of God. But who is the Word of God? Christ. Christ, the Son of God, is the Word of God. So here again, we have Elohim in operation. We have the Father speaking it, and we have the Son doing it. All things in all creation were made through Christ. I'm going to blow your mind. I'm going to blow your mind. So you're out hiking, and as you're hiking, you come to this waterfall. And this waterfall is just beautiful. The water's coming down, cascading down the mountain, and there's these flowers, and you just look at it like, this is God. God created this. Do you know you just called on Jesus? Jesus, because he is in creation and he created that thing, he is drawing you to the Father through creation. All things were made through him. When I look at creation and I look at nature and I'm drawn to God, it's because Christ drew you through creation. He is in all creation. If we establish this faith, if we establish this truth that Elohim God created the heavens and the earth, then how he went about doing it is not as important as who created it. Who created it? If we can just get to that. I, I can go, I can go with any theory. All right, so I believe in the Big Bang theory. Me too. I believe in the Big Bang. God said, let there be light. Jesus went, bang, there was light. Whichever way you want to go, we're good. Check this out, Genesis 1-2. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. You know, I got a problem with this. I got a problem with this verse because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and now it's dull, void, dark, formless. That doesn't sound like a creation of God. And so now I was like bugging out. Like, okay, so maybe older theory is true and God created the heavens and the earth and then there was this destruction and then God had to remake it and then it dawned on me. I had this revelation if I was going to tell you a story, it may start out like this. Once upon a time, there was a guy named Michael and a guy named, oh, girl, girl, guy, girl named Cindy, and they fell in love. 
That's, the, that's like the synopsis. I'm just kind of giving you an overarching view of what this story is going to be about. Now, when Micah was four years old, he always dreamed of being married. Right? So I'm telling you what the story is about, and then I'm getting into the details. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is the storyline. This is what's going to be about. And as he began, the world, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the pace of the deep. Now watch this. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here's what I want you to know today. Anytime the Spirit of God begins moving, something big is about to happen. Something big is about to happen. The Spirit of God begins to move across darkness, and the presence of God brings light into creation. So good. All right, so let's take a look. We're going to look at three theories real quick. What do I have? 19 minutes left. Three theories left. The first theory is called young earth theory. Young earth theory, which basically means this, that the Bible accounts for all of time and all of creation. That day one was a 24-hour day, day two was a 24-hour day, day three was a 24 So God literally created all of creation in six literal 24-hour days. Okay? So I don't have time to read the entire creation story today, but let's look at Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be, that's day one, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. <clears throat> so in Genesis 1-4 here, the word day is the Hebrew word Yam. Say yam. Yam. Yam most commonly is translated day, but it literally means a period of time. So the word yam could mean a 24-hour day, it can mean a 12-hour day, or it can mean an era of time, a time period or a time frame. Okay? So let's just talk about this, because even in the English language, if I say a day, it can be misconstrued. So I was just on a job this weekend, and I put a full day's work in. How many hours did I put in? Why would you assume eight? Why would you assume a full day's work is eight hours? Weak. Are you weak? You only work eight hours in a day? There's 24. Come on, we could do more than that. You assume, if I say I worked a full day, you assume that I'm saying eight hours because you work nine to five or seven to three or whatever it is. But in actuality, we started at 7 in the morning and we didn't finish till 1.30 in the morning. But we put a full day in. It's confusing. The word yom can be confusing too. All I'm saying is we just don't know. We just don't know because the way that the word is said, was it 24 hours or was it 24 million years? All I'm saying is it doesn't matter. The first thing God did was said, let there be light. And however long that took, it took. So what? We don't need to be arguing over that. Did God do it? It doesn't matter how long it took. Get what I'm saying? Okay. So this brings confusion because we want to know exactly how long a yom is. Was it 24 hours? So then it brings theory number two. Theory number two says there's no way that this earth is 6,000 years old. We have geo, you know, uh, geo-aging and all this artifacts and stuff from billions of years ago. So people came up with another theory called old earth or gap theory. Gap theory states that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then there was a fall. That's where Lucifer fell. Lucifer came to the earth, he destroyed the earth. Darkness fell upon the face of the deep. It, that's where the ice age happened. That's where the dinosaurs were dis extinct. All that happened between Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3, it's a story of God recreating the earth. I'm cool with that. That's cool, whatever. I, I have no beef with it if that's what you want to believe, right? It doesn't matter as long as we're talking about who created it, who brought it about. But I want to share with you what my my theory of creation is. Why we have it laid out the way we have it laid out, and I'm going to dare say that maybe you've never seen this before. Day one, 
God says, let there be light, and there's light. Day two, go ahead and put it up on the screen. Day two, <coughs> he says, separate the water from the sky. Day three, he says, let there be land. Yes? Then on day four, he speaks to the light, and he says, bring forth the sun, moon, and stars. So just think about this. There was no sun, moon, and stars, although there was light. What was the light then if there was no sun? Well, we saw in Genesis 1.1 that he says it bring, that Jesus brings the light of life to all men. It was the presence of God coming into our universe and into our existence. But look, on the left-hand side, this is the habitation where the things in this side would live. So the sun, moon, and stars live inside of the light from day one. Day two, he says, let there be sky. Day five, he said, day five, he speaks to the air and he says, bring forth the birds. He speaks to the habitation to bring forth the inhabitant. On day three, he speaks to the land and he says, let all land-bearing animals come forth and they do on day six. Day six is parallel to three, five is parallel to two, four is parallel to one. But then he does something startling at the end of day six. He doesn't speak to the light, he doesn't speak to the sky, he doesn't speak to the land. At the end of day six he says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Who's he speaking to? Himself. He spoke to the light, he spoke to the sky, he spoke to the land. He spoke to the habitation to bring forth the inhabitant. Then he says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He's speaking to himself. So where is man to abide? What is our habitation? In him. We are to abide in him. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask anything. We are to rest and inhabit the praises and the, and the presence of God while on earth. While on earth. We are, we are both a physical being and a spiritual being. We are made imago Dei, image and likeness of God, both spiritually and to then have a physical relationship with him as well. And on the seventh day, he did the best thing, he rested. Not because he was tired, but to give us an example of what we need in our lives and in our bodies to have a Sabbath day. In my opinion, this is the best theory. Does it make it right? We're all guessing. We're all guessing. We're not equipped enough with the data that we have from the Bible. We don't have enough data to know 100% for sure. And that's where faith kicks in. So will I argue with someone about creation and try to convince them that my theory is correct? No. Can we agree that God, Elohim God created, then cool. Let's have fun challenging each other. Let's figure some stuff out. But it doesn't matter. It's not going to get us to heaven or not get us to heaven because we believe a certain creation theory. It's all about God. Did God create the heavens and the earth? If you don't believe that God created the heavens and the earth, it nullifies the rest of the Bible for you. The point of creation the point of Genesis 1 is to point you to who, not how. And it's just our human nature. We always get hung up on how. But how, but how. Built a shed in my yard. Someone says, yo, P. Mike, how did you build that shed? Well, what are you asking me exactly? Are you asking me how many nails I used? Are you asking me that I used 16 penny nails, that I used 10 deep nails? Are you asking me how many yards of concrete I used and what kind of lumber? Or are you saying, how did you know how to do that? Well, I YouTubed it. I watched YouTube and I just did it. Right? And so we get hung up and say, but I want to know exactly how all of creation happened. And you can't handle that. I can't handle that. We can never fathom, rationalize it, or understand it. 
So we have the best version of the story. It's a poetic, beautiful story of God creating a masterpiece of art so that people could worship and adorn and have a relationship with him. And if we can believe that, then all of those little details don't really matter. I'm going to ask you today, have you put that faith in God? Have you put God in that place as creator God? Because if it be true that Elohim God created the heavens and the earth and everything after it, then it means that you have a purpose in this life. It means you have a purpose in this life. That out of all the DNA that could have come together when your mom and dad had babies, you came about. Meaning that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. A plan and a purpose. And the number one purpose is to move his kingdom forward. So they say, but how do, I get a, into, how do I get a part of that? How do I step into that? Well, you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. You invite him into your life. You begin this journey that, that he accepts you just the way you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you there. But he will take you from faith to faith and glory to glory. If you're watching online or you're in the room today and you've never had the opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd love to invite you to pray this prayer with us today. And as a family, we all say it together. It goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.